Welcome to the Quality Improvement Basics course Process Mapping Module. Our topics in this module will cover learning what process mapping is and how it can help to identify what improvements we are able to make in our work, understanding how process maps support quality improvement and where it fits into the overall model for improvement methodology, learning the basics to create a process map. We'll step through a real world example in this module and in the final module of the course we'll again provide another process mapping example. Also, before we start, please open the related documents for this module, tools, templates, and any samples which are available on the web page where you found this module link. It will help you to have those ready for quick reference as screenshots of the documents may not be legible on your screen. What is process mapping? To start off, we'll need a few working definitions before we dive into the detail of process mapping. First off, what is a process? Generally, it is a complete set of activities or steps designed to produce a result that helps to accomplish a particular organizational goal. Additionally, a process is a set of tasks that are sequenced together which have a logical beginning, something that triggers the process to start, and an endpoint, which is the output or result of the process. We'll have an example coming up in a few slides that will help clarify this. Workflow gets into the detail of how the process works, determining who does what when. Workflow is the combination of detailed steps, tasks, or events, and or decision points that support the process, which enable the overall process to achieve its goal. In a basic sense, a process is the overall high-level picture of how work is being carried out, and workflow is a study and details of how that process actually gets done. You'll hear them used interchangeably at times, and people are often referring to the same thing. With the previous definitions in mind, Process mapping is a visual exercise in diagramming work involved from beginning to end and determining what steps and tasks are needed to complete the work that results in the output at the end of the process. This is the more detailed workflow analysis needed to build a step-by-step -step diagram of how the process is accomplished. Process mapping is a method to visually display, discuss, and understand how we actually carry out our work versus how we think the work is being done. One of the primary benefits of process mapping is discovering the gaps between what actually happens versus what we believe is happening or how we think the policies, procedures, and protocols are being carried out. A visual process map helps a group, such as your quality improvement team, see the larger scope of the process as well as drill down into the specifics of individual process steps and tasks. This fosters discussion and debate around the process so that improvements and modifications can be made to yield better patient outcomes. Once you have mapped out a process, determine changes that your team believes will enable the needed improvements. Those changes may be as simple as making tweaks to your existing process or doing a complete redesign and possibly starting from scratch. An example of a complete redesign is when you move off paper and implement a new electronic healthcare record system. The end goal may be the same, but the way the tasks will be executed is fundamentally different. In one of the final slides of our QI Basics module, we learned that processes are part of our larger system. Systems are made up of interconnected components such as people, equipment, environment, and processes. And with systems thinking, we recognize that everything is connected. And when a change is made in one process, it can cause changes elsewhere in the system. We need to think about the entire system in order to anticipate the broader impact of any changes we make. So, as you create a process map, have your team consider if any changes you'll make will impact that larger system that you work in. When you map out a process, you are gaining insights into how work is actually done, and this helps you answer the third question in the model for improvement. What change can we make that will result in improvement? Once we have diagrammed the current process and understand how the work is actually done, we can begin a discussion around what changes are needed. Additionally, this would be the point where you can apply root cause analysis and utilize the five whys tool to gain insight as to what the problem is that you're trying to correct. We can take our current state process diagram and modify it to create a future state process map which reflects our proposed changes. Based on this new future state process diagram, we can implement the desired changes and test this future state process. And that is where our new process map and PDSA tool interact. Your team has identified changes that are needed to the process based on the process diagram. And now you will document how these changes are carried out by utilizing the PDSA tool to test out the hypothesis that your proposed changes will bring about the desired improvements. 
The changes you are making to the process are part of the plan step of the PDSA tool, and you'll test your modified process during the do step of the tool. Then study the changes or results and take action in the final step, either adapt, adopt, or abandon those process modifications. During the PDSA rapid change test cycle, the new approach to carry out the process will provide data, feedback, and experience, part of the do step. That then enables us to reconvene and discuss how we can optimize the new process, part of the study step, as it is unlikely that the future process design will be perfect, which sets your team up for the second round of PDSA rapid cycle testing. In other words, the act step would be to adapt the changes you made and start a second PDSA test with some further modifications to the process. Here are the five basic steps to integrating process mapping into your QI teamwork. One, map out the current state. How do we actually do our work? Two, with the process diagram in hand, we can begin a discussion around what changes are needed. Remember that the proposed change is the answer to the third question of the model for improvement. What change can we make that will result in an improvement? Three, once we have some agreement, we can take our current state process diagram and build the future state map out the desired process, and integrate the desired changes. Four, based on the new future state process diagram, we can implement the desired changes and test the future state process. This is the do step of the PDSA tool. During this step, the test of your new process is generating data, which answers the second question of the model for improvement. How will we know change is an improvement? You know because your QI team has chosen some way to measure the process. This is exactly the information that you'll need to study for the final step here. Five, based on your PDSA tests, the new approach to carrying out the process has provided data, feedback, and experience that enables your QI team to reconvene and discuss whether to adapt, adopt, or abandon the process changes. In steps four and five here, you will study and then act on the modifications to your process. So why do process mapping? Why is visually diagramming a process so effective and useful? The power of process mapping lies in the visual representation of your daily work and building and translating the shared mental model into a visual model. There are always aha moments of discovery when we start to diagram and analyze how work gets done in our organizations. You may have been carrying out the work for years and have an aha discovery about some aspect of the process you are engaged in or learn about some surprising and impactful step in a process that someone else is responsible for. Oftentimes, the aha moments are key pieces of information that we need to answer the third question of the model for improvement. What change will result in an improvement? Most of the work we do relies on the combination of people, process, and technology to achieve the process results. Process mapping enables you to determine how the people, process, and technology are integrated to achieve your organizational goals. It also provides opportunities to correct broken processes or processes that aren't very efficient, effective, or achieving desired results. It is truly a unique opportunity to analyze how we do our work and make the best informed decisions to make improvement rather than the just fix it or gut feeling approaches. Additionally, process mapping is a multidisciplinary undertaking that engages process stakeholders, those actually doing the work, and creates buy-in as we change the way we do our work. Those who actually do the work know the intricacies of the individual steps and tasks and are best suited to make recommendations for improving the process, with an eye on always aiming to improve patient outcomes, increase efficiencies, and reduce errors. The process mapping technique will also help your team to visually contrast the perceived process, how we think things are done, versus the actual process, what really is being done, and to determine how the ideal future state process ought to be configured. Let's walk through some of the mechanics of how we map out a process. We'll talk through these and then provide an example. The first step is to frame the process, where you'll want to determine what is included and what is out of scope for a particular process you wish to diagram. Determining the trigger that starts the process and the end result or output is the exercise of framing the process or putting boundaries around the work that you are diagramming. We then identify and document the major steps in the process from the trigger event onto the end result. As you add the steps, jot down who is responsible for carrying out each step. It's usually best to identify them by role or title rather than by specific name, especially when you consider turnover and scaling up or sharing the process with other units or facilities. Consider what process inputs are needed or used in the series of tasks within the process, such as reports, data, equipment, etc. 
As you start to diagram your process, keep thinking who does what and when. Lastly, consider if there are any interdepartmental handoffs. Your end result may be that you hand off work or the result to another department. If the departments or possibly outside organizations are involved along the way, you may need to consider those as separate processes that impact your process or are impacted by your process. A simple example of framing a clinical process, a patient coming in for lab work, is to identify the starting point as a patient arriving and the end point as when they complete their lab work and leave the facility. Processes that are impacted downstream from this process and have their own process triggers and endpoints are the processes of specimens being sent out to the lab, the process of receiving the results, a process to inform the provider of the results, and so on. Once you start diagramming your processes and see how they actually are carried out step by step and by whom, you then have the ability to analyze the process and identify bottlenecks and sources of delay, what factors may be slowing your process or bringing it to a halt, rework due to errors, do you find yourself having to repeat steps in the process due to errors that occur, role ambiguity, this simply means that there's not a clear understanding of who should be performing a task, unnecessary duplications, do any of the tasks get repeated unnecessarily? Sometimes repetition is necessary, such as repeating a blood pressure check for confirmation. We are looking for tasks without a valid reason. Long cycle time. Is there a reason the process is taking so long to perform, whether the task itself is long in duration, or are there unnecessary wait times or delays, particularly patient wait times? Lack of adherence to standards. Are there best practices that are not being observed that negatively impact the optimal results of the process? Lack of information. Do we have all the information to carry out tasks or steps in the process, which can lead to delays and wait times? Lack of quality controls. Here, we are referring to the work we have at hand, quality improvement. Are we measuring the process in a way that we can better understand and improve it? What measures do we have in place to provide information so we can analyze, study, and recommend improvements? Did you notice in this slide that unnecessary duplications is repeated twice? The idea with this intended repetition is that you may make similar discoveries when you visually document the steps of the process. Perhaps not a repetition, but one of the process pitfalls that we just covered in the list. Mapping the process. As we start to create the as-is or current state process diagram, it's helpful to think about how much detail is required. This will vary for each process you diagram, but base the number of steps in detail on the need to understand the process you don't want to get to the point of creating work instructions for each step. A work instruction describes each action that is taken. For example, your EHR vendor or IT department provides a guide on how to reset a password with each click of the mouse and each key we need to press. Too much detail. The 80-20 rule is a good approach. Create a diagram that is useful for discussion using 20% of your time, which approximates how the process steps are carried out. The last 20% of the process diagram usually gets so far into the detail that it takes up 80% of your time. When mapping out the steps, it's quite common to have ahas along the way that unearth the needed details that were not common knowledge or known only to the process experts, those carrying out the work. Follow the 80-20 rule. You can capture the low-hanging fruit or essential steps of the process. You can always add more detail later. The reason we want to create this as-is or current state process map is to first understand how the process is carried out before we attempt to make any modifications, such as when using the QI model for improvement in the PDSA tool. After we document our current process, we can then use the diagram to build the new or future state process and confirm the changes that will lead to the desired improvement. In the spirit of keeping your process diagram simple and easy to understand, for both those inside and outside your quality improvement team, there are three basic shapes. A circle, or oval, for the initial and final steps of the process, a square for each task or step, and a diamond for a decision or question along the way. Similar to the way we read and write, it's best to have the diagram flow from top to bottom and left to right. For the tasks, be sure to label them using the who does what approach, with a subject, verb, and object. The when question is answered by the fact that each step is followed by another. Questions are most frequently yes-no in nature for the diamond and enable the diagram to branch off into different series of tasks based on the answer to the question. Here's a very basic example, which adds one more shape in the lower left representing a document or report in a process. You are not bound to use the shape, and you can use a square or rectangle and make a note that a document or report is being used or required for that step. Take a moment to pause the course 
to walk through the steps in this slide. Here's a sample medication refill process before a clinic started using an EHR to accomplish the process. You'll see that most steps identify who is carrying out the task. This is important as we need to know who is carrying out the work when we modify or redesign the process. You might also think about the time factor. How long does it take to perform each task, and is there a delay between steps? How long and why? Here again, pause the course if you'd like to review this example. The clinic that created the current state process then redesigned their medication refill process to reflect the new EHR-based process. Think back to the people, process, and technology components and how they interact. You can see from the previous slide that many tasks or steps were eliminated along with one decision or diamond step as well. As you can see, this process with far fewer steps is also saving time for all the process stakeholders. Once you feel confident in your basic process mapping skills, you may want to branch out and learn about value mapping, which is part of the lean methodology. This other methodology is very similar, but takes a closer look at how each step in the process provides value to the end customer, most often patients in healthcare. Let's create an example of a basic process map. You'll need to assemble your quality improvement team and those that work directly with the process that you'll be mapping. We'll diagram a very simple annual exam that includes a pre-diabetes risk test or screening process at a primary clinic as our example. You can use sticky notes and a flip chart or whiteboard along with some markers. Let's start with identifying the beginning or trigger and the end of the process. We start the process with a circle. Just draw a circle on a sticky note that states the patient is coming to the clinic for an annual exam and we'll want to ensure that they complete a one-page pre-diabetes risk test, if applicable, and that it gets discussed with their provider during the encounter. The final step is that the encounter is complete and the patient leaves the clinic, also a circle to indicate the final step. We will allow for some space between the circles, the beginning and end of the process, on our flip chart or whiteboard. The patient then checks in at the front desk where we use a square sticky note and then a decision needs to be made. This next step is indicated by a sticky note rotated to indicate a diamond or decision step as to whether the patient should be handed a prediabetes risk test if they meet the guidelines. We are placing the steps in the process where we think they occur and not drawing any connecting lines yet. Doing this allows for further discussion, adding steps that haven't been identified and documented, and reordering steps or decisions that may be out of sequence. If the patient does meet the guidelines for a prediabetes risk test, they are given one, which is one step. Then, an adjacent sticky note indicates the step where they'll fill it out and return it to the receptionist. We jot these steps down on a sticky note and add them to our current state as is process. The patient waits for the medical assistant, MA, to room them in the next step, another yellow square, and then the MA includes the pre-diabetes risk test in the patient chart or among the other encounter documents. So far, so good. As you add steps, consider what improvements you might make to the process and keep those in mind for the next phase of process mapping, which is to analyze and recommend those improvements. However, let's first complete our current state process map. The clinician provides the annual exam, and then the following step is a diamond decision sticky note, which asks if the patient filled out the risk test. You will note that we could have added many steps and details about the exam itself, but the purpose of this process map is to focus on the pre-diabetes risk test and there are many details and steps that occur during the exam that are not relevant to this particular aspect of the process. We are trying to complete the general process using 20% of our time and then go back and figure out the details and have more discussion with 80% of our time remaining. Our process continues with the clinician discussing the prediabetes risk test with the patient followed by another diamond decision step asking if the patient is indeed at risk for prediabetes, that is, was the test positive or negative? If the patient is indeed at risk, then a referral is created to a health coach or the National Diabetes Prevention Program. If not, the exam is over and the patient leaves. Now that we have the major steps identified, your team can discuss and deliberate the sequence, level of detail, who's performing the tasks, and so on. Is there anything that jumps out at you or your team? These are the earlier mentioned aha moments and are the important insights into how work is getting done and where you may be identifying possible improvements. Again, notice that we haven't drawn any connector lines between the steps and decision points yet. Once you have consensus around the process map and steps, you can then begin to draw in the lines. And here we have a completed basic process diagram. Take a picture as we've done here. 
If you have the ability and time to convert this to an electronic diagram using Microsoft Visio, PowerPoint, Word, or some other similar tools, this will give you the ability to electronically modify the current state process and also have a very clear baseline document to create your future state process from. It is important to have this current state diagram present as you deliberate about what changes you want to make to your process. Once again, answering the third question in the model for improvement, what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? Here you can see we have taken our sticky notes and marker process map and converted it to Microsoft Visio. Now that it's in electronic format, it's a bit more legible and ready for any quick modifications or changes that we might need to make. Again, you could use Microsoft Word or PowerPoint with basic shapes and connectors to achieve a similar result. By putting your hand-drawn diagram into electronic format, you have a baseline or current state map that you can use to redesign the process and quickly incorporate desired changes. You'll need to make a determination about the amount of time and effort it will take to convert the hand-drawn process map into an electronic format and what value you believe you'll derive from this. You can certainly continue to use flip charts, whiteboards, and markers. It simply depends on your particular setup. As a quick review, now that you've created a simple process map, are you certain that you've framed the process correctly with the correct beginning or trigger step and the correct end or completion step? Look through your steps and confirm that your steps are sequenced correctly and that you've considered what information, forms, data, etc. is needed for the following step or if there's a decision step that needs to be included. In the last two bullet points here, the idea is to confirm that you have differentiated between a process step or task and a work instruction. A work instruction is much more detailed than a step or task. If your team feels that they need to drill down to get at the minute details of a process, how a particular task is carried out, you are likely entering into the realm of work instructions. An example of a work instruction would be taking a single step like medical assistant puts prediabetes risk test in exam room and expanding that into multiple detailed steps such as medical assistant puts completed prediabetes risk test in patient folder one step, MA walks the folder from the reception to the exam room another step, MA flags the patient folder in some way to get the MD's attention that the prediabetes risk test needs to be discussed during the encounter, yet another, and so on. There may be some detail buried in these work instructions where the improvement is needed if the higher level process steps don't create the needed discussion about what is not working or improvement can be made. In most process diagrams, you won't need to get to this micro level of detail, but if you haven't yet identified what is not working in your process, start exploring at the work instruction level it's best to discuss the process as a whole and examine the major steps and tasks first, then explore specific tasks that are suspect at the work instruction level if needed. This takes more time and you want to be certain that you're exploring the right steps rather than all the steps at the work instruction level. Here is a more developed process map for identification and treatment of hypertension within a clinic. It was converted to an electronic format using Microsoft Visio, the blue boxes or steps represent work done before the patient visits the clinic, orange boxes are during the encounter, and green are post-visit. The white boxes directly above the colored ones indicate roles that carry out the tasks, and there are other identifiers above that. The takeaway here is to show you how you can start with a sticky note process map, clean it up, and then add features that are helpful for your team's discussion and possible presentation outside your QI team. Another technique you can use is called swim lane process mapping. The quick approach to learning this is to create your process map just as you learned here and then look at all the roles, not individual names, and create a horizontal row or swim lane for each role involved in the process. You can see the roles on the left hand side or column in each of the red bordered boxes. Next, take your process map and place each task according to who is responsible for completing a specific task while maintaining the connections between the steps. The end result is that you have a process map that clearly shows who is doing what in your process and this can be a catalyst for further discussion about changes that need to be made such as shifting responsibilities to reduce burden on an overloaded role. The swim lane diagram uses most of the page but typically because process maps flow from top to bottom left to right you'll end up with a large amount of white space especially in those lanes or rows where the role performs only a single task or just a few tasks as part of a more involved process. Note the example of the medical assistant swim lane here with only one task in the process. Let's review a few of the key concepts involved in process mapping. The power of process mapping lies in the visual representation of the process. 
and also creates a shared mental model for your QI team. Process mapping is a vital step in understanding how your organization really carries out its work. Process mapping functions as a catalyst for QI team discussions. Engaging people who do the work is essential to success when diagramming your processes. Understanding and communicating who does what when is the key. Thank you for taking time to learn about process mapping as part of the QI Basics course. Please join me in the next module, Data Basics and Data Collection.